Welcome to another monthly Research Hub community call, where the first topic that we have today is from Jeff, discussing kind of the big picture goals for our new peer review on bioarchive preprints program. So yeah, take it away, Jeff. Actually, this one stemmed from a discussion that a couple of the community members were having in the general chat, which was like, what's, what's the intention and what are we trying to get out of like publicly peer reviewing preprints? What, like, what does that give the scientific community that they didn't have previously? And so just kind of want to, yeah, it's like a, taking a step back from doing that to maybe touch base a little bit to see what do we feel like we're giving and offering to people in the scientific community when we do that? Do they really want that or need it? And is it really pushing the mission of accelerating the pace of scientific research? So, yeah, just wanted to op open the floor to anybody. Yeah, so to, to jump in first, the number one thing that I think would be attractive about, like, if I had stumbled across this on Twitter is like, oh, someone's paying for peer review. Like, it's possible to get compensated for doing, like, peer reviews of public preprints. That's kind of cool. So it's part of me thinks like the content is interesting and valuable, but almost more interesting is the opportunity represented by the content. If that like, you know, makes sense. Yes. Yeah, so it's like one, I think like, I guess there's two selling points, quote unquote selling points. One of them is a selling point to, if you want to be an editor, you can actually get compensated for it. And then the other selling point is if you're a scientist and you post your paper, you can get feedback on it in a really timely manner. So I guess that, that one addresses the, hey, if I'm, a, if I'm interested in being an editor, I'll get compensated for my work. Yeah, so direct feedback, like real life feedback that I got last week when I was in, in Milan, basically talking about what we do from talking with postdocs and, and PhDs. One thing they were, they were really excited about when I told them about the peer reviews is exactly like getting initial feedback before you submit to, to, to the, to the journal so that maybe it's like, it's not that much of a feedback, but it's maybe like what those, like one or two comments that could be one thing that you don't have to address when, when the, the reviewer, when the reviews come, when the review come back, comes, comes back. So I think that is definitely a selling point. Then obviously, if you want to make that point stronger, you need to have, you know, a body of like, you know, people that are actually, you know, capable of, of like giving really good, you know, critique and, and feedback on a, on a specific, um, on a specific topic. But I think we're headed in the right direction because in my opinion, the, the, you know, the first element, the incentivization element is what is probably going to bring the people in. And then the body of knowledge and the body of like the, the expertise of the people is going to, you know, grow as we grow as well. So the second point is also going to strengthen as we, as we grow. Okay. That's actually really good feedback because I received that feedback from the first author of one of the papers I peer reviewed and actually Johnny went and he, he posted on our peer review alerts, Twitter, and she actually ended up retweeting the post and she DM'd me personally and said, oh, thank you for the peer review. You know, we actually are already looking into a lot of the comments that you had made on there. So at least if, you know, it wasn't actually helpful, we were on the right track of those contents being helpful because they were already working on adjusting those things. So that's, that seems like the value we can bring to people. I think an end state for these, which is going to require, I think a lot more business development is, and like interaction with universities is to make our peer reviews validated for a peer review that would impact the career of the person. So. You know, right now they're waiting to go publish in a journal and the journal will give them peer reviews and they're officially published. I think if we can get to that point with our peer reviews being weighted the same as that, then people will be happy too, because it's a quick turnaround and they're not losing out on a career, you know, boost. One thing this makes me think of just of like the structure of the program, like maybe the way that we should be presenting this is like Tyler posts a preprint you know, from bioarchive and then like somebody else puts a bounty on it and then a third person does the peer review. So, because I feel like there's a, you know, value within, I'm, you know, a scientist, I need feedback. I'll put a bounty on this, you know, to get the peer review, you know, from the community person, you know, maybe rather than, 
you know, kind of like a mini APC type of situation that encourages another third party to come in and do the peer review. And then in that, I, I like that structure. Who, who would be putting up the bounty for that peer review? Do you think the author of the preprint would be willing to put up a, a bounty to, to get that feedback? Down the line, yeah, eventually. I think like we could probably subsidize it, you know, to get started, but just to show like the use case of you share a preprint, you put a bounty on it, you'll get feedback. I think what, one thing, Pat, for this is if we can maybe you through the research hub community account on the platform, maybe use some of those funds earned from bounties, bounty fees, put those towards helping subsidize some of those peer reviews. And then you have kind of like a cyclical uh, economy of we earn, you know, earn fees, put that back towards subsidizing bounties for peer review. Oh, that's ridiculously cool. That's really, really cool. Cause then it makes you feel good when you do the bounty, like you're kind of contributing to this pot of community peer reviews. Yeah. So you feel it's almost like the money you're putting towards something and the fee that's being taken is almost going towards like, it's going towards a donation, you know, it's almost like charitable, you know, oh. so it, it does feel kind of good. So yeah, I think, I think we should look into this bounty for peer review option a lot more. Malik. Yeah. I just wanted to add on along the lines of what you and Patrick were, you know, mentioning was one, I think if we keep doing this, then it will like get our name out there with like not only just the traditional like academic researchers, but a lot more also on the other DSI communities. I think us as a platform, you know, like will, the role that, you know, we can play in this whole like ecosystem is, you know, how we can get interaction of scientists more easily on our platform and peer review and, you know, better, help with the literature search that everybody needs. Like that's, that's like the first thing that I can foresee our, you know, platform doing. And so right now it may seem like, okay, like, you know, I, I picked and I haven't received any feedback from any authors. I've done like two or three of this, but I feel like if we keep doing it for months and months, then eventually BioRix will also like acknowledge us and people will see that, oh, there is definitely value in this. I think we'll have to create the value. Uh, right now, it may not seem like every paper we review would be helpful, but eventually, you know, we will be heard. And there is a significant amount of black or dissent amongst re academic researchers right now with the amount of like earnings that journals do and scientists and reviewers are not getting paid. I mean, we also a glaucoma flag and has been like, posting and stuff. So I think we are at the right time. If we just keep up at it, then we might eventually get the, you know, the, the public that we need, you know? Okay. So what I'm hearing again is this seems like there's an emphasis on the, the, the review, the editors being paid. And that's something that we need to convey the message of more because I know that there was that neuroimaging journal where all of the peer reviewers and editors just kind of uprooted and left. And it, it does seem to be creating quite the buzz around in the scientific community. So, okay. So keep heads forward and then emphasize the paid peer review, Tyler, and then we'll go Cole and Johnny. Yeah. I think this also brings us a lot closer to the ultimate goal of research hub, which is like accelerating the pace of science. So it'll do this because like, we're getting more towards the discrete publications where when you review in public, then you can see these incremental gains. And then also get your reviews of like what you should change a whole lot faster in a public forum. Then you get closer to this, like iterating in public and incremental gains where you don't have to like wait for this macro publication. You can kind of just publish initially on what the small thing is and then extend it. So again, the messaging of like iterate in public and making incremental gains. Yeah. And just hitting home that like there's friction in science that doesn't need to be there and maybe overly formalized. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. I just want to echo, like I, like you, Jeff, I've had one of the head or first authors of the publications reach out to me after I posted 
the peer review because I tagged them on Twitter and they came out with a bunch of comments and were very thankful of the ultimately minor edits, but still something that could reject them from a journal by not having everything just succinctly together. Also in terms of getting the peer reviews out there, maybe it's something we should consider of also posting the peer reviews on the comment section of BioArchive because it has a spot for that. So that also brings visibility to Research Hub. And then as we get further down the line, maybe we could cement some guidelines to ensure the quality of the peer reviews. So that way, like when people come to Research Hub, they know what to kind of expect because right now the peer reviews are kind of all over the place and we don't really have a standardized way of making sure we have quality peer reviews. Yeah, that is, that's really good. Feedback. Like, you know, cause I think sometimes it's a game of inches with getting published. So like if they can, you can help them with that. Even little things like, even like gr grammatical things sometimes, or like just the way that a figure is laid out, you know, something's hard to read or, you know, like those things are very helpful to them. And definitely the comments on bio archive, uh, I'm making a note of this in like a personal notes and I can post all those notes publicly afterwards, but I think that'd be a good one to comment in bio archive. That Unless we can get to a point where bio archive would just alert people if a peer review happens from us. And then the last point Cole was the variability in the quality of the peer reviews. And we definitely noticed that. I noticed when there's like a really high quality one and notice when something is a few sentences. So I think we want to keep it open for the first couple months just to see what gets thrown out there. But I think, it, I think it's now time to really kind of, I think have to filter away some of the people that are not putting quality peer review commentary out there. And if they want to put quality peer review commentary, then they can go and fulfill a bounty for a peer review. And then, and then they can earn whatever income from that. All right, Johnny. Okay. Yeah. First of all, great for that, how like Jeffrey and Cole are corroborating the evidence that Ricardo gathered in Milan. And basically people appreciate pre-publication commentary. And I do think that the, the, in terms of adding the value, that's exactly where you add the value to a preprint. If you give somebody free advice that helps them get published, that's definitely appreciated, I think. But what I really, what I wanted to talk about is that since I am ma making the post on Twitter to promote this, I didn't really put the emphasis that the, the editors are getting paid so much uh, on the forefront, but I didn't know how important that was. So I'm glad I'm here. I only t told people that if they interact with the content, they can earn uh, tokens, but how, how do you want me to put it out? Like, do you have any advice for me? It, because the person I'm talking to cannot straightforwardly get paid, right? So I could tell them about applying to become an editor or what, what can I, how can I engage them? Yeah. One thing that I like that you do in the post, Johnny, is you try to tag if they have a Twitter, the peer reviewer, right? So you'd like, you know, tag my handle or you tag Cole, Cole's handle, maybe like a little, like snippet in there right before that, you can just be like, uh, you know, and our, you know, paid peer reviewer, Cole, you know, who received compensation for this peer review or something like that, just so it's alerted that people are receiving, it's like a little more subtle than it is just a blatant, Hey, we're paying everyone, Ooh. Uh, but maybe we want to be blatant. So I don't know what everyone else thinks. Okay. Then, then um, wait, I will wait for a little bit. I think this is tricky, Johnny, like, uh... I think we should kind of throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. So, so maybe like try a bunch of different tweets, you know, ranges of subtlety and then see which one you like the best. The other approach is that, that like, I have almost assembled that like a couple of questions for the editors and just like mention it there. Like we talked about this last time, Patrick, and then you said that like the editor of the month idea, and it doesn't necessarily have to be of the month, but I like that too, that we have an editor of the month, but it would also be nice to also just have this meet the editors. And in that post, you can also mention it. It's like, hey, this guy is making research coins from 
making peer reviews and then what's your experience then, then it's sort of legit to mention it uh, okay and then and another thing that i had but maybe we could talk about how how i could distribute this once i have made the the questions and then uh, one thing is that jeffrey mentioned that he was talking about the end game of what this could be like and how one thing that it reminded me of is that a lot of journals and conferences are struggling to find peer reviewers. It's difficult. They need two peer reviewers per thing. So they could be the ones putting up bounties because they're actually scrambling to find somebody to review stuff. And yeah, that that's one thing that whether it's at least a pain point where people might need this. Yeah, so you're you're saying maybe it, we're, we begin we need to open up a dialogue between us and some of these journals that are needing the, the peer reviewers, and this is something we've talked about before. I don't know, definitely me and Ricardo have about like offering peer review as a service. That's like research hubs. What research hubs good at is curating the peer reviewers because we're paying them, and then the journals can come to try to get those curated peer reviewers from us yeah well okay that, that now i had too many points mixed but it would still be interesting to to talk about how to distribute the the questions to the editors because i i don't see anything wrong with like doing it sort of all at once and then, and then posting it uh, one by one and cool did you have a, a commentary on on johnny's point there yeah in regards to contacting the journals i know that like there are a lot of journals at these conferences would it be worthwhile even just buying some advertising space at the conferences to set up like a competitive situation where hey one of the features is we pay our editors at all, at a competitive rate and we have examples of quality peer reviews so instead of going through the whole application process of the journals come to research hub and just get your things peer reviewed by bringing attention to it because we are also looking for people that want their items peer reviewed or maybe taking out like advertising space on twitter for that like making a specific post like hey we want to look at your preprints post them here and we'll peer review them I, I like it. So put the money towards putting like towards an advertising on Research Hub Foundation's Twitter, um, just to see like how successful it would be and like what the reach was and things like that. So I'll take a look at some of like the metrics that came out of that and see how impactful it is. And then we can maybe consider doing two initiatives. Maybe that's an action item out of here, which is gonna be looking at advertising space. Worth the money more than like our Twitter kind of advertising would be. So that's an action item that we can come out of this. Cool. Would, would you be interested in, in looking into something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I can look into that. If we can talk a little bit more about fleshing out the specific details of what that would entail afterwards. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. yeah. Once we have a good like baseline of just are we talking order of magnitude difference in pricing then yeah then we can go from there okay super all right awesome good good feedback johnny yeah one last thing that i have on my mind is like regarding the the payment what the, the thing that you should suggest is also way to make it more visible that you are getting paid for peer review so if you could exactly implement it that the peer reviewers they claim the bounty that make that a visible process and it looks like constantly to the outside it looks like a strand of engagement and so you could just be the one who claims it still first. Right. So that is okay. a good idea to without saying it, just show it. Okay. I, you, I, the audio was cutting out a bit, Johnny, but I think what I got out of it was rather than just stating it show the process of a bounty going up for peer review and then someone answering the peer review and just outline that process publicly so it's seen and doesn't have to be said. 
Exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me let me jot that down right now. But is there is there any other hands up on this topic? I don't want to kind of monopolize the whole hour with this topic. But if there's anything else anyone wants to mention, feel free to. Yeah. One quick thing on that. If we're talking about Twitter posts for advertising, like say the process of peer review or just a blatant advertisement, like we can do split testing to specifically see which does better if that's part of an advertising budget. So we can test it feet on the ground and see what works. Yeah, I think that's the best approach for, for all the things we're doing this early on is we just need to try a few things like Patrick was mentioning and just see what sticks. But to see what sticks, we need to make sure that we're assessing. Jeff, I'm Jeff. sorry. I don't know if it's You're me, but I can't hear you very well. Okay, you're probably covering the microphone. Are you? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, like I was saying. So I think what Patrick was saying and, and what you just said, Cole, which is we try a bunch of things in parallel, see what works really well. But the one important thing with that, and I think something we haven't done very well in the past is like making sure we have metrics and KPIs that really would alert us that we're doing well in this domain versus that domain. So if we push an initiative, just to, a reminder to like really set the metric that we want to look out of this appropriately so we can say with confidence that it is better this way than that way okay so i'm going to finish jotting down some of the notes that johnny and cole just mentioned but uh, i think patrick the next one might be might be a you um, topic right yeah totally that was a good discussion though thank you jeff so one thing i wanted to grab your guys opinion on is the meta study feature kobe's Releasing a new paper page here in the next couple of days where like in theory, we'll be able to extract PDFs and turn them into HTML and actually like have the paper in the paper page and be able to do cool things like highlighting and inline commenting. And so we're kind of sprucing up like the, we're calling it the document page, but basically like the page you land on when clicking into a post or a paper or a question or anything else on research hub. And so the meta study feature is like one of those document page like features. And in theory, it's pretty different than like a lot of the other document pages. And so supporting it is kind of like time consuming and will like take engineering resources away from actually building new stuff. <clears throat> and so we're thinking about deprecating it and kind of as like a, a post-mortem, like we'd like to hear like what everyone's thoughts are on the meta studies feature and like why do we think like people weren't totally using it and like i think there are interesting ways it could come back in the future but yeah i just wanted to like grab like i think sort of post-mortem feedback from everybody on like why they think it didn't work i think the most complex so i first of all i like the feature i was one of the early supporters of the of the feature i just think that ux wise is it's just complex to make because just like you're literally like putting out a concept and trying to find what is for what is against a you know specific claim and so it takes time it takes a decent amount of curation by different people because if i do it alone it doesn't really matter you need a bunch of people doing it and um and you need to see like kind of like excitement around a specific question so that you want to contribute. And so I think it's a, it's a mix of like a complex UX in general, not like how we built it in just a general complex to, to, to build this feature and uh, kind of like a, probably like a lacking network effect around the feature. That is probably what, what made it fail. If, 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 you know, if we're, you were to, to ask me. Yeah, that's, that's amazing diagnosis, Ricardo. Thank you. That's awesome. Does anybody else have thoughts? I would say, I'm sorry, Jeff, go ahead. So. Just, I just wanted to make a quick comment that I was kind of surprised that the meta studies feature didn't take off. I thought it was like a really compelling one. And I actually, um, actually talked to a couple people in my lab and they were, they were really, really like excited about the meta studies aspect of research hub or on research hub, but then they would never, like they didn't use it. 
So that was like kind of interesting to me. So it feels like there's a discrepancy with like there's an interest in it, but for some reason there was no usage of it. And so I wonder if the concept there is the right concept. But like Ricardo was saying, the implementation maybe needs to get tweaked, but that's a lot of work to go back and forth on implementing it. So yeah, I don't know, just an, something I've heard from some of the people in my lab. Yeah, no, that's also super helpful. It is a compelling concept for sure. Like to be able to, you know, like have evidence laid out like in like stacked ranked order supporting a theory or negating it is definitely it, like it seems like pretty cool. It, it is a lot of work though. It's like a review paper basically to do. Is there a place where like we we AI this and like instead of people putting in the work, like we have the AI really try to rank this and then maybe what people get paid for is like the reinforcement learning of like how well they think the AI did in ranking that? Yeah, hundred percent. That's what I think will probably happen in the future is this feels like a lot more natural occurring within the notebook. You know, you're like saving references. Maybe some references are suggested. People are annotating the references like through the notebook. Maybe it's all in like one folder people are working on, but yeah, even, even that, like maybe that's a better, like like interface for people to interact with this feature, but it's still gonna be tough to get the actual like incentives, right? Like who gets rewarded for what, who knows when what is right. It's definitely a complicated thing. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah, sorry, Nathan, I, I took over some time. No, that's all right. Question for Patrick, what's the timeline on which you were thinking it was gonna be removed? It's sometime within the next week or two. There's There's like no like total rush for it, but when we ship the new, um, paper page will probably end up removing that feature just because it'll be inconsistent with the design. Okay. Yeah. Just, just because I, to be honest, I, I have an application for it that I could try because I have been collecting these papers about GLP one agonists. And to be honest, it just slipped my mind that we had a meta studies feature that it would be suited for. But I mean, if the decision has been made, then, then that's fine. But. To be honest, I think, I think it was a pretty good feature. I, th I completely agree with Ricardo. I think it was just a, a question of it not being incentivized in the same way. It, it would have been interesting if, for instance, we had editors have the option of creating a meta study rather than a peer review for a month, see how that went. But, but yeah, obviously, I, I think it was one of those where it's even slipped my mind as someone who you know tries to keep up to date with Research Hub's features that it was an option. So I think it's just one of those things where when you have a lot of different features, one can often slip off the edge. Totally. One quick thing on the reinforcement learning. It could be really cool if in the reference manager that users are prompted with a question when they close a paper saying like, how would you rate the rigor of the study? Or like, how are the methods rated in order to just gather like consensus feedback about how papers are just with a quick one or two questions. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there are a lot of really cool things we can do, I think with an LLM and like use like some of the unique aspects of research hub, which is like our audience and kind of ability to measure reputation and have that feedback into a model somehow. Cool. Yeah, Nathan, thank you. That's definitely helpful. It is a cool idea. And I think it also might be another thing where like, if enough people were doing it, then more people would, but you know, it's hard to kind of like do something all by yourself and not see any like interaction or like meaningful feedback because it does take a lot of work to even read somebody else's and be like, oh, is this paper relevant? You know, th there's a lot of just work in general around it. Yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts? Just like uh, to like uh, connect that with like a really like a higher point, which is, I think there's like a, a lot of things on research hub just generally that do require like a fair bit of bandwidth to do on the platform. Like I know, I guess clicking an upvote or a downvote, not too much, but if you want to do it properly, you probably have to assess the thing you're upvoting and downvoting pretty well. But I, I do think that's like a little barrier for like a weekly active contributor kind of goal. So um, what, I, what I'm really excited for is definitely kind of like a reference manager type of thing where you can do really lightweight actions that will reflect activity on the platform. But I think right now there's a lot of like, you know, deep, you know, hours of work type of things that are, that are on there. Yeah, totally. A hundred percent. Cause even like it's way a weekly active contributor in this case could just be someone browsing PubMed and clicking like save to reference manager. 
and then that data, you know, ends up showing up on researchhub.com. So yeah, that is the barrier is like even much lower than upvoting, I think. I think an, a, another thing relating to that is I could see a meta studies feature working quite well with our notebook feature. So if you could create a notebook to start with when you're collecting papers and studies and you haven't quite worked out which ones are pros, which ones are cons, and how you're going to frame this into a question, but then easily convert that so that you transfer some, the notebook papers into a meta study, then actually perhaps you could see people transitioning to using that more rather than having to go down one way or the other when they first start collecting. Totally. Yeah, I, I think this will come back in like a V2 kind of with the combination of the reference manager, like an LLM and an integration to the notebook where you can ask a question, hey, like, you know, is the earth flat, right? And then it'll populate all of the papers that say the earth is flat and all the papers that say the earth isn't flat. And then we can have the community provide feedback on the selections to improve them. Cool. Um, yeah, no, this is super helpful. Any like uh, last thoughts from you guys that I can uh, report back to the rest of the team or? Can I make a quick broader point is that I think the meta studies feature along with some of the other ones is a situation where I think it's very hard to assess the usefulness of a feature in isolation when, for instance, you could see a realm where reference manager, bounties, peer reviews and meta studies all work together once they're all, you know, at this, a certain level of usability where actually they sync with each other. And if we, you know, if you trial one and then take it out, it might not quite give you the full picture. Yeah, totally. E even now, like leaving comments, like under other people's papers, if I use like a, another paper to reference, like you have to click into it, grab the figure, you know, grab the actual data point when eventually like we'll have it where it can be almost just like a YouTube or not YouTube, but Wikipedia preview link where like it's really easy to like add to your comment and then others can just like hover over it, see the relevant data point, why it applies to the paper you're currently on. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff like low hanging fruit that we can do around references that'll make it like pretty nice to use research hub. I was just thinking in terms of usability, like meta studies completely slipped my mind in terms of visibility, would it be better to maybe format the website so that way there's a visual banner that scrolls through all of the things that are being offered. So that way it puts it more prominently on people's mind. So that way, for example, like the tabs as they are right now, there's all papers, posts, questions, meta studies, bounties. If it had the way that other websites do where it just scrolls through every three or four seconds. So even if people are on the homepage, just passively, it brings it up on their radar. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I think like a, a larger issue that we have in general with our current website is like the most interesting content. You can't really see it from the homepage, but like you see the titles of the paper, but like if, you know, Nathan spends four hours reading the paper and doing a peer review, you can't see that effort from the homepage. And so I think meta studies are kind of somewhere where it's a lot of effort and like, you can't really see anything interesting, you know, until you click into it. So. Yeah, we, we have thoughts on like how more like standard social media feeds rather than like a Reddit style feed could be better to help uncover some of that. But we even had an idea like a while ago, and this has come up multiple times of like a Instagram stories type of thing at the top of the page where like specific posts are like intentionally put there for people to kind of flip through. So that way, like we could highlight, you know, all the different features of research hub rather than you having to like specifically look for a meta study or something like that. But so, so I guess like one point that I want to like ask everybody is how many people just kind of like forgot they existed? Like, is that like a common feeling due to the like lack of visibility? Almost everyone. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Also, I would keep in mind that some features might not work like some some features might be network dependent so we, we might we might see that you know this feature is like has been you know not a you know not a great success but maybe you know you get you know you know t t 10x the people and the feature that you know would be used the most is actually you know the meta study one so i feel like it's it's complicated to judge features because it depends on like so many different you know criteria and parameters so that you know in general i think we we did a really good 
think about you know on in building so many things so that you know when you know you actually we're we'll gonna have more people will see what what they like the most out of all the things that we built yeah this is this is really interesting insight thank you all even just like the ability to surface or bring attention to like new stuff that we're building would be useful so like yeah we definitely need to think about how to do that better um cool yes that's all i had for that topic jeff do you want to talk about ai or i can do like basically marketing feedback for the reference manager or manager landing page i think you could do that one patrick and then if we've got extra time we could like briefly touch on the ai stuff but it's not too important okay cool yeah so i'll share a screen here hold on one second and so the concept here is since the reference manager is a little bit of a standalone product we want to have like a, a landing page we can send people to that's more marketing in nature where it's basically like hey like here's why you should use the research hub reference manager versus like any other competitor so yeah, this is like a very early copy, but what do you all think are the, like the arguments that we should highlight, you know, like first and foremost, when people like come to this landing page? I think you should be focusing on the usability and how seamless it would be. Because if you're using a reference manager, at least when I was doing more of that, it always felt clunky and like a very specific process that I needed to go and put it in the reference manager afterwards and less so on the features, but just with you scrolling over, would it be valuable to color brand it to research hubs colors or is that not a priority? You mean like these colors versus these ones? Yeah. Like just having the color branding of research hub consistent. Yeah, I think we would definitely do that. These these are like very early options. So just more so to like extremely high level show what these could look like. But yeah, they'll probably end up looking something like this. I think, Pat, one of the things to emphasize more that I like didn't see at, the, at least at the top of some of these banners was like you can get rewarded for your scientific or your, your you know, using of the reference manager. I think mm -hmm. that's like a kind of big one because, I, I mean, there's a lot of throughput that goes into a reference manager. So even if like the reward per, per like discrete unit that's going in is not high, there's a large volume going in. And uh, I think that could be something like as a grad student who are like probably the biggest users of a reference manager, I would say that that would be something compelling for them. And I think that's like a unique selling point that we have. I think like what Nicole was saying, which is like essentially bringing reference managers to like the modern age is one thing, you know, to make it look just like a techie thing, but then also getting rewarded is another big one that sets us apart and I think would be compelling for a grad student. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, those are, those are great arguments for sure. I guess like Jeff, how would you like to see the getting rewarded like phrased basically? Like yeah. earn for your data or? Like it depends what we're what we're gonna like reward for. Yeah, like you know you know yeah, earn for your data or get rewarded for get rewarded for using or something like that or maybe even just at the top like organized papers get rewarded, you know something like that. Okay, cool. I know that's a great point. I don't actually I'm curious what is everyone else's opinion on like the actual reward or like the incentive reward and advertising it through that way do you guys think that's like too much on the rewards thing or because in my eyes i think that's an important thing but i don't know if that's the case with a lot of other scientists yeah Malik? yeah i think initially the reward thing is is a good idea because it will as you said like draw attention of grad students but then once they are on the page, then they will say, oh, this has the other functions too, like that, like the lab notebook is gonna be synced in with it. So I can pretty much write the paper entirely on here 
and not have to use the word document processor at all. Uh, and by the way, I can also connect with all those other scientists in my field. So, but the reward will bring, you know, other utilities in limelight too. So definitely some reward initially. That's great to know, Malik. And that's an interesting perspective. I think we're like 50, 50 between like, do you lean into, Hey, you're earning value for your data or like the social aspect. So being able to like follow specific scientists or like see other people's thoughts on a paper that you're about to read, which one's more compelling to you all between those two, like earning crypto for your like reference manager, you know, actions or like being able to like get followers for your reference manager actions slash follow other people. I think they kind of go hand in hand. Like it makes you a science communicator, kind of like a mini Andrew Huberman, right? Cause you're socializing your science and then also you have some incentive to do it. So I don't, there may be a way that you could actually say both at the same time. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I think both are important, but for me, the incentivization, like the fact that you're getting rewarded for this would push me to try if I wasn't going to use it, it would be like, oh, this is great. I need to use a reference manager anyway, and I can get rewarded in crypto for doing this. That would be enough, or that would be more of an incentive to use this over competitors. Interesting. That's good to know. I think it's it's kind of hard, Pat, because like the nature of a scientist, it, it's like there's still, like there's two, it's like bifurcated in the types of people that exist in science. Like some like truly just don't care about financial rewards. And so then it's like, you're kind of going to miss them in the bucket of if you lean into the rewards, then there's people who like care about like getting paid more because they don't get paid anything. And so I think just the nature of science, it's so bifurcated like that, that it makes sense. You guys were 50, 50 on it. Um, personally, I'm also like leaning in the rewards bucket. It's like a more like a 60, 40 rewards than that, but the socializing stuff is really cool too. This is great feedback though. Cause I think we can probably like somehow include all of those concepts above the fold, um, like organize papers, you know, gain followers, get paid or something, who knows, but yeah, no, this is great. Thank you. The only thing is if we incentivize the, if we focus on the rewards, are we going to be attracting high quality reference manager users? Or are we going to be incentivizing, you know, sort of volume over quality, if that makes sense. It's, it's a great point. Yeah. So one thing we were thinking about is like letting anybody use the reference manager, but then basically having like a limited rollout of who can do social stuff or like basically have the reference manager be followed. There's definitely a lot to kind of work out there, but yeah, it's a, it's a really good point where like some of the great content creators might hear earning crypto and be like, no, thanks. Cool. Yeah. Any other big picture thoughts here? This has been super helpful. I think we can definitely incorporate all those concepts in here. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I think the, the next thing we have is, uh, uh, Jeff put a comment here asking about the most impactful implementation of AI on the platform. And so, yeah, this is definitely something we've been thinking a lot about. We have an engineer who has like played with OpenAI's API already starting in a couple weeks. So we'll probably start to build in like some kind of like LLM focused feature. There's like, you know, I'm sure everybody here knows, like there's like infinity directions that it could go in whether like we even like tried to train our own model, use open AIs, like just do chat with a PDF. You, you can spin up basically chat with a PDF in like two or three days. So that's like the absolute minimum that we could do. But for me personally, even thinking like from that last landing page, like how do you get people to use a reference manager? Like it makes a lot of sense to me to throw it into the reference manager somehow, like you know, maybe it's helping you draft introduction sections. Maybe it's suggesting citations that you missed that you should include. Yeah, not 100% sure, but that feels like we'd almost be guaranteed to get people to at least try us if, if we had that as one of the selling points. 
in this regard, I've been working with a friend of mine from work and specifically making a, a uh, like a interactive, interact with a PDF with AI. One of the things that goes into considering that is that to use chat GPT like requires tokens, depending on how much you want to work with. So I can maybe talk with you at a later point about that, because we've gotten pretty far in developing that. It's just, he's on his honeymoon. So he's a little indisposed right now, but basic, yeah, but just bringing, or once that's finished, I can help bring that over as a tool that maybe research hub could use, but it would require either like a hard cap on the ability or the number of questions asked or the amount of output that you can get from it or the ability to use RSC to generate your answers. Yeah, totally. It's a great point. And those API calls can definitely get expensive over time. There, there are LLMs that I think are cheaper. We could even potentially do our own, which would be, you know, more expensive up front, but we might be able to like, kind of like customize it. So it's a little bit more effective, but yeah, I, I guess like if we did use open AI's version, we'd probably end up like having some kind of research coin cost associated with it. Sort of like how we have like you pay research coin to get a DOI, it, you know, way different scale, but similar concept. Were you planning to, were you considering Claude or going straight to GPT-4? Because one problem that I had with LLMs is that, I mean, I think the, the major limitation now LLMs have is the context window. And so if you're like, thinking about giving them a text and like, you know, chat with them or like, you know, asking questions, you have a hard time getting the right answers. Cause unfortunately they lose track of like what they say, what they think it's just, they're not, they're not extended enough. Claude, by the way, has a hundred K context window and it's much better, but it's limited in, in use. And so, yeah, open question on like, what, what are you thinking, you know, of using and, and why? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a ton of choices and it feels like more, you know, come out like every week. So we haven't even like, I guess, like fully started to dive into this. I know the easiest to spin up is open AIs. So it's possible that we might just, I think it depends on the feature, what we'd want to do, but it's possible we might just spin up the easiest thing first and then see if people use it. And then if people use it, you know, start to like look at like how we can do it better. So like if people need a lot of context, you know, maybe switching models or like doing our own. And then I know like there are some projects that actually like use a bunch of different models and they'll like basically like divert the query to the one that's like best for whatever the question is. So yeah, there's, there's like infinity ways to set it up and I'm definitely not an expert. So like when we got like Florin working on this. I'll have him join one of these calls and like share sort of his like dream case scenario and hear what you guys think. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. I think one thing that we have on research hub, which is a strength is that people are very fastidious and good and incentivized at uploading papers, especially relating to what they're looking at and their own papers. And I think that lends itself quite well to a sort of auto GPT API. So if I'm looking at a certain area, like. This almost relates back to mess studies in a way, but like if I'm looking at GLP-1 agonists and I upload a bunch of papers and categorize, let's say tag them all under that project, I could then just ask AutoGPT a question and it could answer it from the papers that I've uploaded. Because on Research Hub, we've done a good job, fairly good job of hubs and tagging. I think that could be quite a neat way in which actually that could be having to manually upload every time onto AutoGPT yourself. Yeah, that's super interesting. Tower? Yeah, I drafted up a doc a while ago about this, and I think there's a lot of things you can do when writing a paper. If you have an AI that has access to all like PubMed data and even like public repositories, like if you're writing, it'd be awesome if you had the expert in the field sitting over your shoulder saying, that's a new idea that needs more robust evidence. That's a contradictory statement. 
that doesn't match the literature, like all those things, and then kind of following the logic of the paper as you build it and basically saying, you know, how good is the argument that you're building as you're writing it? Sort of the, I think like end state implementation of this, have you guys seen advertisements for, it's called like Con Migo, it's Khan Academy's sort of like buddy that follows you around like throughout the website. It does like exactly that. It's basically like a tutor where like, say you're in an English class or whatever. The example they had was like, you know, what's the symbolic, what's the meaning or read an essay about the symbolic meaning of the end of Moby Dick. And the LLM is being like, Hey, like you structured this argument poorly. Like if you remove this sentence and like added more evidence to point two, then like, it would be so much more compelling. So yeah, I think like something like that, where it's like, you know, you're sitting at an MDPI paper right now, but if you were to like, you know, change, like, you know, the result listed here and add another experiment, like maybe you've got a cell paper, some, some kind of like editorial assistance, you know, I think would be pretty cool. Exactly. And it alleviates like the number one concern of all scientists, which is that they haven't read the full field or they're missing some information or they're misinterpreting. So then they're more likely to like do stuff a little faster and trust themselves and yeah, just move quicker. I would pay for it personally. Totally. Yeah. There's, there's so many cool things we can do. Cause one thing Kobe and I were even talking about is like, like having experts chat with the model in order to basically say like, Hey, correct this model when it says something that's wrong you know, in order to like pay people who do it and then have the model get better. But like, if you had all the experts in a field, like there would be certain places where two different experts are like giving the model different feedback and you could like specifically highlight where there's disagreement in fields among experts and then fund experiments in those, in those like areas, you know, so there's a lot of really, really cool things that I think we could do in, in the future with this kind of thing. So yeah, keep, keep, keep the brains turning because I bet we're only like 10% scratching the surface right now. It reminds me of that. Do you guys remember on those like Pentium 3 Windows 95 computers, the little shitty paper clip that was yeah, like yeah. in the bottom corner? This kind of reminds me of like a smart paper clip, but like we could use like the research hub flask or something cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. One thing, one thing that can be threaded in here and uh, yeah, Clippy. Yeah, Clippy. One thing we could thread in here too is like reputation because uh, like how do you assess who's like an expert or you don't want like people to come spam like training the llm and they're like not cut out to train it and give their feedback so just just a, t a comment about weighting things with reputation or filtering by reputation to be able to to train the, the llm totally i feel like that's what would give us an advantage versus you know other you know, scientific yeah. venues is like understanding people's reputation, letting there be weighted feedback, you know, based on it. Totally. I had one comment just generally that no one has anything else for the AI stuff. I was, so I was talking to my wife who is really intrigued on like the notebook feature. And she keeps coming back to this idea of like, like using the notebook and having predefined templates for like. For different techniques so like if you're running a western blot like here's the western blot template and while you're you know when you're typing in instead of going to your lab notebook you just say you know the date and then like i use you know there's pre-fillable things like primary antibody secondary antibody exposure time for the western blot and these things are almost like an air table like fillable thing where it's like actually like stored in like a database and uh, when you go to write your paper it's a lot easier to now just like reference this and it makes it a lot easier to include like a detailed flow of your method, which is what you don't see in papers. Now in papers, they say here, we did this and this, and they don't go into the details of what they really did. And it's hard to recapitulate a lot of those papers because the method's not fully fleshed out. And so she was thinking that it'd be a really great way to alleviate some of those problems in science. If we just had predefined templates. Which, which by the way, she said she'd be happy to create for some of the techniques she's familiar with. And even to store like inventory for your lab. So you can easily just say, I use this product and it'll auto fill in, or it has metadata for the catalog number and all these things. So just curious to hear your guys' thoughts on that. And if you guys think it's a cool idea, I'll have Sam take a stab at a few of those templates. 
I think it's a super cool idea. Have you heard of protocols.io before, Jeff? Have you seen this? I'm not sure if it's like exactly what you're describing, but it's sort of similar. I haven't looked into this, no. It's basically like a social network for methods, kind of, where people can publish their methods and have them go like alongside publications. And so I think there's a way to try and find like the mean uh, you know, method for like a specific experiment and then try and auto-generate those like templates. And even like, I really like this idea a lot because like, I think the very, very end state of research hub, what it should be is not even doing papers at all, but people just publish those Western blots. You know, you just publish like a live stream of data, you know, and then you alongside anyone else can use that data in order to construct like a larger argument. And so... Yeah, it would be really, really cool if we could like help people publish data in a way that like makes it really easy for them to do so, including like, you know, keeping methods. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to send this her way and then maybe just get, just have her do a few just to get the gears moving and just see if it's something that's got legs or not. Totally. It also kind of reminds me of Benchling a little bit. Like I think Benchling kind of does this for molecular biology and it's super duper helpful. So I could see that being extended to lots of different fields. Okay, okay, right on. Okay, thanks for the feedback guys. One more thing kind of along these lines is that like getting closer to like, I think Balaji talked about the like derivative of publications and how you can kind of like cite on chain, but it'd be really cool if you could embed larger amounts of text in your paper as you're writing it and then automatically like link it to the citation manager. So instead of having to like rewrite your entire introduction every single time when you're in the same field writing the same paper, you could sort of, sort of like embed that citation in it. And then it's kind of like a pseudo notebook outline, but it's it's like, you don't need to rewrite it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I even think it's like, that's what the LLM would be so helpful for is you just have like a collection of references and you can like, you know, pick and choose which ones you want to add to any given publication, depending on, you know, what's relevant to it. And then it just fits exactly. out you know, the sentences. Yeah, that'd be super helpful. Cool. Yes, yeah, so thank you guys. It's been super helpful. I guess uh, any last minute thoughts, feedback, comments in general before we get out of here? Cool. Well, thanks everybody. Um, I guess we'll see you next week. Yep. Bye everyone. Yeah. Bye. See you guys. See you guys. See you. Good to see everyone. Thanks. Thank you.